Hello and welcome to Insight of Thermology. This is Dr. Amrit welcoming you to another lecture. Today we are studying phototransduction or the visual cycle. First is what is phototransduction? Light falls on retina and it is absorbed by the photosensitive pigments which are present in the rods and cones. This will cause a series of photochemical changes in the rods and cone finally leading to the electrical changes in their membrane potential. And this process of changing of light energy into electrical changes finally leading to vision is called phototransduction. We know that the rods and the cones, they basically have the outer segment, an inner segment and a synaptic region. Now the question is, where does phototransduction occur? It basically occurs in the discs which are present in the outer segment of the rods and also in the cones. We know the outer segment of rods actually have this arrangement of several discs stacked on each other. Now if we actually zoom this disc of the outer segment, let me now introduce to you the various characters of this video. In this video, we shall be studying about the rhodopsin and how rhodopsin affects another character that is the transducin and we have the phosphodiesterase which is affected by the transducin. However, you should know that phosphodiesterase always exists with its two gamma subunits. Apart from that, we shall be talking about another important character and that is the sodium channels. So first of all, what is rhodopsin? Rhodopsin is actually a photosensitive visual pigment which is present in the disc of the outer segments of the rod. It is actually a G protein coupled receptor. It is one of those serpentine receptors. It has two subunits. The one basic one is a protein and apart from the protein which is called opsin, we have a carotenoid. This carotenoid is derived from vitamin A and therefore it is also called vitamin A aldehyde or also called retinin. Apart from that, the name with which it is famous is the 11 cis retinal. So here you can see in orange is the opsin and we have a small component of the vitamin A which is the 11 cis retinal, very important component. Now going a step further, so let us see what exactly happens when light strikes the retina inside the rhodopsin molecule where we have the 11 cis retinal at the carbon 11 and carbon 12 bond, there will be a conformational change such that we get from 11 cis retinal all trans retinal. So these two are actually isomers that means the 11 cis retinal and the all trans retinal if you carefully observe they have similar chemical composition that means the same number of carbon atoms the same number of hydrogen atoms however their shapes are different. So rhodopsin will be actually converted that means the 11 cis retinal in the rhodopsin will finally be converted into the all trans retinal through a series of steps. So these steps are as follows the rhodopsin is first converted into the bathorhodopsin then we get lumirhodopsin then we get metarhodopsin 1 and finally we get metarhodopsin 2 which is the active rhodopsin containing the all trans retinal. Remember all this happens in the presence of light. So, as I told you that activated rhodopsin and how was the rhodopsin activated by the presence of light? It basically has all trans retinal in it. Now, as the conformational change occurs and it becomes metarhodopsin 2, they cannot live together. Opsin and all trans retinal will now have to separate from each other and this process which is induced by light, that is the separation of the opsin, from the all trans retinal is called rhodopsin bleaching or the photo decomposition. Are you with me? So we completed the character rhodopsin. Next we have the transducer. Okay, this guy in red color. So basically our activated rhodopsin has the all trans retinal, right? Now this is called active rhodopsin because it is going to go and activate our next protein that is the transducer. So our next character that is a transducin is a GDP, GTP exchange proteins. Now it has two forms. It has an inactive form and an active form. The active form basically has the GTP attached to it and the inactive form has a GDP attached to it. The question is how will it be activated? So it is our activated opsin which will go and bind to transducin and activate the transducin. 
So our activated opsin molecule, we know how it gets activated from rhodopsin to metarhodopsin 2. Metarhodopsin 2 actually has all trans retinol. The opsin will now separate from the all trans retinol and this opsin will now develop this binding site on it. And now what happens is that with this binding site, this opsin is going to go and bind to your inactive transducin which had GDP before and that GDP will now be exchanged with GTP and therefore we will get an active transducin. Now once we have an active rhodopsin, an active transducin, let us now introduce the third character and that is the phosphodiesterase enzyme. So our phosphodiesterase enzyme is also present in the membrane and the thing is that in its inactive form it has these two gamma units attached on the either side and obviously once you remove these gamma units from the phosphodiesterase you will have an active molecule of phosphodiesterase enzyme again the question is what will activate phosphodiesterase so you might have guessed it by now it is our activated transducin which has a gtp in it so that will come and activate your inactive phosphodiesterase okay so what happens is it basically your transducin is actually a trimeric protein that means it has three parts so one part of your transducin which has gtp attached to it is going to come down to your gamma unit of the phosphodiesterase and it will actually attach to that gamma unit of the phosphodiesterase and subsequently it will try to separate that gamma unit from your phosphodiesterase gamma complex but the thing is, we still have this phosphodiesterase as inactive because of the presence of one more gamma unit to it. So what will happen next? One more transducin which is activated by your opsin will come forth and try to remove this gamma unit. And therefore, finally, the gamma units from both the sides of the phosphodiesterase will be removed and you will get an activated phosphodiesterase. So now we got our activated phosphodiesterase molecule. But did I tell you what is the function of this phosphodiesterase? The function is that it will convert your cyclic GMP to the normal guanine monophosphate or the GMP. So the cyclic GMP will represent in brown color and the GMP will represent in the blue color. Now what happens is, as you can see, as your phosphodiesterase will get activated, all your cyclic GMP is getting converted to your GMP. So obviously, the cyclic GMP concentration is coming down and there will be a decrease in the levels of cyclic GMP. So remember that cyclic GMP is also a very important component and you will understand it better when I introduce to you the next character of the story, which is the sodium channels. Your sodium channels can either be open or it could be closed. So the top one is an open sodium channel and the bottom one is a closed sodium channel. Now if you see carefully, I have drawn a brown color ball near the open sodium channel and that brown color is nothing but it is a cyclic GMP. Whereas the blue color is a normal GMP. So you can say that the sodium channels will open in the presence of your cyclic GMP and they will close whenever there is a normal GMP around that channel so basically in dark what happens is these channels will be open and therefore the sodium channels will be open in dark because of the increased level of cyclic gmp however in the presence of light do you remember all the characters what was happening light was bringing all those characters and activating them whether it was rhodopsin transducin and then the phosphodiesterase enzyme so this phosphodiesterase enzyme then led to decrease in the cyclic GMP concentration and ultimately what will happen as the cyclic GMP goes down, the GMP increases and therefore the channels will remain closed and therefore in light the channels will actually close. So that's a very important point regarding this character. So basically what is happening in our dark is that we have cyclic GMP, we have open sodium channels and because of this increased level of cyclic GMP more and more amount of sodiums is actually entering the cell. The cell is becoming relatively positive and this is called depolarization which occurs in the dark phase. 
Whereas in light, what happens, we have our active character of phosphodiesterase, which is actually converting your cyclic GMP to your GMP and the GMP concentration is rising and therefore the channels are closed and therefore the sodium is going to start accumulating outside the cell. The inside of the cell is going to become more and more negative and this is called hyperpolarization which occurs in the light phase. So, do you know that some changes also occur in the inner segment of the rod? So, in the inner segment of the rod, we have a sodium pump which will actively keep on pumping the sodium out. So, obviously, the inside of the cell in the inner segment will become negative because all the positives are coming out. And obviously, in the outer segment, we know we have seen that the sodium from outside is entering inside through those sodium channels, right? This is what we already saw. And these channels are going to open in dark. So, because of this variable ionic conduction inside the cell, that means the outer segment is relatively positive in the dark because of the sodium entering and the inner segment is relatively negative because the sodium is exiting through the pump, we get a particular type of current flowing from the outer segment, inner segment and going up to your uh, synaptic terminals and this current is called the dark current okay and this dark current is basically because of the depolarization of the photoreceptor i already told you what is depolarization as the receptor gets depolarized we will have the release of the neurotransmitter from the synaptic terminals and mostly this neurotransmitter is glutamate there are some changes between other sensory cells and the rods and cones. In the other sensory cell, the receptor will get activated by depolarization and then we will have an action potential generation and finally we will have the release of the neurotransmitter. However, in rods and cones, you saw that in dark, the receptor was depolarized. However, when light came about, there was actually receptor hyperpolarization. And then that leads to generation of graded change in the potential and not action potential. Moreover, the neurotransmitter was being released in the dark. And let me tell you, it is also released in the light also. However, there's a graded change in the amount of neurotransmitter that is being released at the postsynaptic neuron. On. So that is some important differences between the sensory cells and the rods and cones. So basically what happens in dark, there is some amount of negativity inside that is called the resting membrane potential and that is about 40 millivolts and obviously when light strikes there is a progressive increase in the negativity inside and you will see the, the membrane potential reaching minus 65 millivolts because of the hyperpolarization. So this over here is actually an introduction to another character of the story and that is the calcium channels. Okay, understanding this character is very important if you want to understand how this all entire process of phototransduction will actually come to a halt. Okay, so the voltage gated calcium channels are actually present at the presynaptic terminals. Okay, so you can see that here I've drawn them in pink color. These vesicles are actually containing your neurotransmitters. Now, I already told you that in the outer segment, in the dark, what is happening? The sodium channels are open and the sodium is entering the outer segment. Now, let me tell you that along with sodium, a little bit amount of calcium is also going to enter into the outer segment to keep the photoreceptors depolarized. Because the amount of calcium in the rods is more in dark, the number of calcium channels in the synaptic terminal will also be more and uh, will be open more and this will lead to more amount of neurotransmitter release. So the rate of neurotransmitter release is correspondingly great in compared to dark compared to light. So in the light what happens again we know that in light what happens the sodium channels will close so even the calcium enters through those sodium channels the amount of calcium will also be less the rods are hyperpolarized number of open calcium channels will therefore be reduced and the rate of neurotransmitter will also be reduced at the synaptic terminal. So in dark we have depolarization that ultimately causes an increased neurotransmitter release. However in light we have hyperpolarization and that causes a decreased neurotransmitter release. Okay so this is what you can actually understand here through this diagram. So in the dark what is happening? The sodium is able to enter, even the calcium is able to enter, the cyclic GMP levels are more and what do we see? We see that the 
this arrow is actually towards a deeper right state. That means the inside of the cell is not as negative as compared to the light. So in light, what happens? The cyclic GMP levels will be less. The uh, GMP levels will be more and therefore the sodium channels will be closed. The inside of the cell will become more negative. See, the arrow is tilting more towards the negative side and there will be hyperpolarization. Therefore, in the presence of darkness, there is depolarization and in light, there is hyperpolarization of the receptor. Now, I think this would be a right time to introduce you to the signal amplification concept. We know that in the disc segment or in the disc of the outer segment we have these various discs and all these discs individually also have so many molecules of transducent sitting on that a single light activated rhodopsin can actually activate about 800 transducent molecules which is about eight percent of the total molecules which are sitting on the disc surface so just look at that number now either one or two transducent molecules will go and activate one phosphodiesterase molecule Okay, now actually there's a controversy about it that some sources say that we need two transducent molecules to activate one phosphodiesterase enzyme and some sources say that we need only one transducent molecule to activate one phosphodiesterase molecule. Okay, so what do you think about it? Just let me know in the comment section. Now each phosphodiesterase can actually break down about six cyclic GMP molecules. Okay, so this, there's so much amount of signal amplification that a single photon by a rhodopsin molecule can actually lead to closure of about 200 sodium ion channels. And that is about 2% of the number of channels in each rod that are actually open in the dark, right? And this, this amount of channel closure will cause a net change in the membrane potential of about 1 millivolt. Okay, so this a light amplification the magnitude of this amplification actually varies with the prevailing level of illumination you change the level of illumination and you can change the amplification signal now this is called light adaptation so the concentration of calcium in the outer segment is very very important the cyclic gmp gated channels in the outer segment as i told you they are permeable to both sodium as well as calcium and therefore when the light causes closure of these channels there will be a net decrease in the internal calcium concentration as well now as the internal calcium concentration goes down what happens is that there's another protein which gets activated, another enzyme gets activated and that enzyme is the guanylate cyclase and it will now lead to production of the cyclic GMP and we know what happens when the cyclic GMP increases. So when the cyclic GMP will increase, the sodium channels will now open. Apart from that, the cyclic GM, this guanyl cyclase will also increase the affinity of the cyclic GMP gated channels for the CGMP. This will cause the sodium channels to open and sodium and calcium will now enter the cells. The calcium concentration will now increase and the phototransduction uh, amplification, whatever we saw, will now start decreasing. Okay, so that is how the phototransduction is actually controlled. Okay, now there's another protein which is called arrestin. So this arrestin basically what, what it does is that it actually blocks the ability of rhodopsin to activate transducin and facilitates the breakdown of activated rhodopsin. So this arrestin is going to arrest the rhodopsin and prevent this rhodopsin from further activating transducin. So definitely phototransduction is an important process, but everything needs to be controlled after some time. And we have this important calcium channels. We have this guanyl cyclase that we studied about. And also we have this important protein molecule, which is called arrestin which will regulate our phototransduction. So after this phototransduction stops, the rhodopsin will undergo regeneration, which is nothing but the all trans retinol will be converted to 11 cis retinol again, which is called, which is done by the retinal isomerase enzyme. The 11 cis retinol will again join with opsin and leads to formation of rhodopsin. This occurs in the retinal pigment epithelium, by the way. So now let us join all these dots together. So there are basically three main photochemical reactions which are occurring in the rods. We have a rhodopsin bleaching, rhodopsin regeneration and the visual cycle. Now it will become very easy for you. The first step is rhodopsin bleaching. We saw that when light strikes the retina, 
the 11 cis retinal will undergo isomerization change and gets converted into all trans retinal through a series of changes of course. Now this process is called rhodopsin bleaching or photo decompression. The next step is the rhodopsin regeneration. We know how it occurs. All trans retinal gets converted back to its original form. Rhodopsin which was broken down again forms a new rhodopsin. This is called rhodopsin regeneration. So degeneration basically is dependent on light. However, the regeneration occurs equally in light as well as dark. So that's an important point. So the first process by which 11 cis retinal is converted into all trans retinal is called photo bleaching or photo decomposition. And the second process by which it is regenerated back to 11 cis retinal is called photo regeneration. And there is always a balance in the eye between the two. Now this balance and this cycle is called the Wald's visual cycle. So that was a detailed video on phototransduction. I hope you were able to follow it. I hope it was useful. Thank you and have a nice day.